Um, maybe, Liz, have we got any apologies for absence? Um, yes, we've received apologies from Councillor Hazel Morris, um, Councillor Gloria Tanner and Helen St John. Shall I do the roll call? Yeah. Yes, um, Okay. Can Mandy everybody... Evans. Oh, excuse me, I Liz, I sort of get for drinking. Mandy before. Evans. Okay. Joe Hale. Chris Holly. Present. Paxton Hood Williams. Present. Yvonne Jardine. Jeff Jones. Sorry, yes. Susan Jones. Yes, I'm here. Erica Kirshner. Tony Bedu. Present. Clive Lloyd. Yeah, yeah. Dave House. Yes. Amy Hawkins. Uh, yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can I just before the meeting starts, um, just uh, draw your attention to the passing of Peter Marr, who worked for the authority from 1978 and he retired as Director of Social Services in 1996. He's recently passed away. Tony, I don't know whether you want to say anything about Peter because I think you worked with him. I would like to say a, a few words, Chair, if that's appropriate. Um, Please. Peter and I, for various uh, reasons, found ourselves on the same side in a lot of battles with the, uh, what I think we termed the forces of darkness in Cardiff. And um, I'm pleased to say that we, uh, we we won a good many of those battles. Um, I mean, I suppose Peter's greatest achievement was to uh, manage the uh, his Swansea end of the decanting of uh, Hensel Hospital and the resettlement of a good many people with learning disabilities or mental handicaps, as they were called in those days. A slight improvement on when when I joined the service because they were labelled as mental mentally subnormal, mm. um, and uh, that was one of Peter's finest achievements. In fact, he did so well that we got an instruction from the then Welsh office to slow down because we were doing it too quickly and everybody else was getting annoyed and jealous of us. But Peter was a fabulous director of social services. Uh, he worked very well with Hugh Gardner and with Mike O'Leary across a range of services. A good friend to the health authority in times when we were. In, in difficulties and I hope we were a good friend to him um, when when he was in difficulties as well. I will, I will miss him greatly. He was a good colleague and um, I hope I'm just not going to embarrass uh, anybody here but I'd just like to say that I'm, I'm delighted to see that his tradition is being maintained today by people in, in, the, in a similar office. Thank you Chair. Thank you Tony. Uh, I actually worked under Peter Marr for the All Real Strategy so I know exactly what you're saying so thank you for that tribute and our condolences to the family. Mm. Thank you. If we go on now to disclosures of personal and prejudicial interests, please, are there any? Chris, your... Uh... Yeah, my daughter works for social services. Lovely, thank you. Liz will record that and send you the information. Uh, prohibition of whipped votes and declaration of party whips. And come right before we start now, can I ask you all to turn your mics off and raise your hands if you need to speak? OK, we'll go on to the minutes of the previous meeting. And I will go page one. Page two. And page three. Uh, Anybody, can I have a, a vote that they were a true record? I, I move you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And I take the silence that everybody agrees. OK, uh, we go on to now the items. Let me go back to the agenda a minute. Sorry. This is very difficult not to have a copy in front of you. Uh, public question time, Liz. Is there, are there any public questions? Um, no, no questions have been submitted. Okay, Doug. So we go on to item six now: performance monitoring. And Amy, are you going to go through this? Lovely. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm uh, 
going to take the position that I, I hope you've had a chance to have a look at the report because it's um, quite long, so I'm not going to take it through page by page or we'll still be here at, you know, eight o'clock. Um, so I'll um, just uh, give you some of the headline. I've got um, seven things I particularly want to highlight from the report. I hope that's a, a reasonable summary. Um, what I would say, and I'm covering both Helen and um, my areas of work in the update today as well. So um, again, if there's any questions afterwards, I'll cover for both of us, hopefully. Um, the general position is uh, this is the February report and at the end of February things had were really beginning to improve um, overall. Uh, we, we had such a challenging December and January, but that by the time February came, I think we were really quite pleased, you know, that things things were looking um, improved. And, I, and thankfully, I'd like to report, obviously, things are looking an awful lot better again now. Um, almost to that sort of I almost want to say business as usual, but we're not business as usual because we're living with COVID, but, but things are definitely settled. Um, with some of the um, performance information in the report, I wanted to highlight around the common access point. That's obviously our uh, entry into the service. There were slightly less inquiries in um, February and, and in January, actually, compared to last year. The um, Some of this is attributed to the fact that safeguarding team referrals um, now are going uh, directly to our um, unique team that we've set up, so our um, safeguarding team. But also um, what I would point out is that, um, and, and Helen has in her narrative as well on the um, second page, is around the complexity of the inquiries we're getting. So whilst there are less of them, um, we're finding that many more, almost a third, in fact, were um, going to the social work teams. And each call the team are taking an awful long time with, you know, they know they're spending longer on each call and the complexity. It, it's not come as a surprise. We knew this would happen with the, the year we've had, but it's, um, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing it in the common access point and what's flowing through to our social work teams um, and uh, the difference between last year with what's going to the social work teams is around 50 a month more inquiries are going to our social work teams so it's obviously quite significant um, the work that then gets picked up by those teams in the reviews and the sort of allocation of work um, we, I, I think it's worth pointing out now, whilst this is a February report, um, just in terms of live information from today, um, we've gone live with WCCIS um, as of last week, so our information um, system that we use. Um, so uh, some of the, info, the report information you have around reviews will look quite different in months to come. You know, we'll have slightly different information, but, but what you've got for the February report um, is around the um, social work teams as they are at the moment in terms of the initial assessment team and the long-term team. And so the long-term team um, now are responsible for all the reviews and we're seeing a slight improvement there, but it's also allowing us to see the position of where we are and um, to keep the reviews in date. So we ensure that everyone has their annual review. Um, with the mental health, learning disabilities and older persons mental health teams, uh, we are, we've got um, some uh, this performance information around the uh, mental health teams is very good. Learning disabilities, we know we've got a bit of work to do and there's a real focus on the teams around um, ensuring those reviews are up to date. That said, we have been um, risk rating all the clients and ensuring that we maintain contact with everybody. So whilst the formal review may not have happened, we've um, uh, rag rated it. So red, amber, green, every client and um, or person that we're working with and uh, and linking with them um, could be, well, the contact could be every other day if that's what's been required, you know, or but for very regular contact um, to ensure that their wellbeing supports in place. Um, the carers assessments um, and is one area as well. That's the next bit on the report I wanted to highlight. We are only um, we're not really seeing um, much difference in our stats yet in terms of the carers assessments. Um, but the, the work is being focused in this area. We've got a, a cross departmental sort of approach to this um, and a carers assessment and action plan is being um, put in place. This is um, linking into some regional and national work that's happening. Um, but our priorities um, we're looking at is around recognising support um, to continue to enable individuals to continue to care, um, support to live alongside their caring responsibilities. So whether that's respite provision or other support that's required for individuals and also information, advice and guidance. So both within our own in-house services and that which we commission as well to ensure that there's appropriate support for carers. So that work will develop in the um, coming year, really. I think it's a, it's a really key area of focus for us because, again, you'll have seen it. You know how much priority um, ha has, sorry, how much focus has been on carers and also how much um, it will continue to in the, in the coming year. Um, 
In terms of our care home data, I think, um, th as I mentioned at the beginning, things are looking um, it's a much more improved position. I think we were um, reporting quite so sort of worrying positions in terms of staffing levels and other aspects in, in the previous performance report, but things are, are definitely more stable now. Um, we do have a number of vacancies across um, our provision, and that's something we're looking at now in terms of um, implementing the um, older persons residential uh, reviews that were picked up a few years ago and, and making sure that works linked in with the needs um, both in Swansea and the region in terms of um, residential need. Uh, we're offering um, emergency day provision still. Nearly all our day services are open, but we are limited by social distancing. So as, as much as we'd like to offer, you know, every single session, every single day, it's, you know, we're really limited by space. So it's around 30 percent capacity. Uh, but that's uh, there's good take up of that. Um, the um, with to support our care home still in February, we had the rapid response team, which was the emergency team we put in place for 24 seven cover for emergency staffing where required both in our internal and external care homes. That went really well. And in fact, we only stood that down after the Easter bank holiday weekend. So we ensured that was in place. And, and I'm really pleased to report that we we don't think we need that at the moment, although it's there and ready. Um, and reablement and bottom mind, just to tell you about that, it's um it's working really well. Again, in February we had a few sort of uh, issues still around sort of post-COVID kind of impact of um a submission numbers um to do with uh, you know, when we were in lockdown and uh, when and sites get locked down um, but um, a lot of work's been done around that and um, to ensure that uh, there's a really good pathway now between the hospital and Bonamine as well it's working really well. February we had 14 beds available oh sorry and in March as well we're now up to 19 so we're, we're seeing a really good interest in um, Bonamine and that's working really well with the flow. Um, just um, two final things to update you on. Uh, the um, reablement hours, as Helen's put in her side of the narrative, there's um, been a, a really um, big increase in fe February in the amount of reablement hours that um, we've been offering in terms of our DOM care support um, and also our long term care, so our external providers. Um, we've seen um, a really good increase and um, in how quick it's taking between there being a need for um, long term care and how quickly the providers can offer it. And the peak, it, it took around sort of up to 55 days to find the most appropriate um, support for people, but we're now on average six days. So that's that was a position statement between sort of sec September 19 was our sort of peak. And, and now our current position is it's taken around six and a half days. And um, brokerage figures are excellent. Um, today, I can, sorry, I don't have the figures from the end of February, but th they're in the report in terms of the average. Uh, but today there's two people on brokerage waiting for um, Dom care support. So I mean, it's just really, really good position to be in. Um, and finally, the um, safeguarding team's working very well. The performance information shows you that. Um, and the backlog in the deprivation of liberty safeguards is beginning to see an improvement. And we secured some additional money um, in January to help us um, address that backlog. So I'm hoping to report in the next coming months how we'll see hopefully the backlog gone. So that's hopefully succinct enough. Thank you, Amy. You're very good. <laughs> Lovely. Are there any questions for Amy? Chris, you're first. Your hands up. Right. Th thank you, Amy, for your report. A um, couple of issues. Um, obviously, during COVID, performance monitoring through the rest of the council has been very, very difficult. It's virtually not, in, not possible in some cases. So, some of the um, <clears throat> Some of the information you've given us is very timely, uh, considering where, where we are. A right, couple of things. Um, how does it has the report? How does this compare to last year and the year before? You know, I know with the COVID, it's difficult to compare like with like, but um, I know the reporting system has changed as well. So, is there any way that we can compare what we've got here in front of us now with what we had? in a normal year, I say that without COVID-19. That's the first thing. And then the other thing is you said about the day services. What are the actual provisions currently for the day services uh, and and how do they compare with, you know, two years ago now? Because we can't, it was, it's impossible to compare with last year. Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, 
on each page and um, where there's performance report where we can we've given you comparative figures to last year so if you take something like the common access point which is on page um three we're, we're saying that um there was 649 inquiries in february but in this time last year there was 965 inquiries so whilst that's showing a um 300 difference in inquiries that is partly attributed to the fact that now all the safeguarding referrals go direct to that team so that accounts for 173 of them but there still is that difference that over 100 difference um and, we, and you can see it in fact in the graphs because the graphs are showing a oh gosh it's really small on my screen uh, 2019 um we give you the graphs quite often depends on the stats we've got so most pages have got a like for like from last year but of course we're now getting to the stage of almost being in the start of COVID last year as well. So some of it is is not comparable. So where possible, we've given you the year before as well. Some of the information can't be like for like um, when we look at performance of certain teams. So with the social work teams, they used to be in area hubs. We're now based on a functional model. So the short term, the common access point, the initial assessment team and the long term team. But um, where possible, we've given you what we can in terms of like for like data. Generally, I think as a sort of general flavour, it's there are less people coming into us now. It is something we're reasonably concerned about. Is this because they're just not known to us? Is that because people have been um, finding a lot of um, uh, support within their communities? You know, there's a, if you look at the amount of activity, for example, with our local area coordination, you know, that's that's tripled, for example, you know, so we know that some of the preventative work is is really um, increased. But or are they just not known to us and are, are going to come and we're going to be overwhelmed? That is the potential. Um, but we also know um, the complexity of people. You know, people are coming to us really with quite complex needs. So it's um, it's something we're we're really looking at quite closely just to, to see what we can do. So if there's anything you want in terms of report, we can try and run reports as well of doing everything like for like. I can certainly go back to the team and ask them if we can get some comparative data year on year. I think it's going to be quite difficult to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah. I think maybe a waste, a waste of time, really. Okay. I think the more important thing is that we look at our occupancy levels, our residential units and the domiciliary care how, and, and what the take up of that is. I think once those are the important factors and safeguarding, and if we look at those issues, I think it, but it would be nice that if we could say every six months had a had a snapshot of what it's like in that six months and then that that date is more relevant than it you know than having it at say six or seven months later on so i think that's probably the best way of doing it but i don't think it's worth going back and doing anything now because i think it, you know time moves on doesn't it and things have moved on yeah so and thank I, you very much no problem i'll just tell you about the day services but i think it's um it's particularly with residential as well it's going to be very much about what the whole market looks like because we've got vacancies but so so do um uh, the private sector as well and and also looking at um what people will want you know there, there might be less demand in terms of um uh, residential or different demand around residential as well it could be more reablement and so we're, we're getting prepared and, and developing options there with the day support provision um everything is provided as was but we are really limited on capacity as mentioned so it's around 30 percent of the provision but we're getting full uptake it's looked at every week by the team requests come in for individuals and we try and accommodate where we can but where someone might have accessed uh, the support five days a week before it they may only be able to access two days a week at the moment so to enable more um as service users to use the service but we are supporting with alternative methods like our flexible support team who do the outreach work and also um uh, direct payments you know so people can buy in or or you you know have personal um assistance or or um go and use uh, other suppliers as well but the clientele uh fine. The, um, the 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 point that access and the, and the criteria for access has changed anyway, so you know we would see a change in the numbers anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Be on, Jeff Jones, Councillor Jeff Jones. Yeah, Amy, you've answered uh, quite a bit of. I was going to ask you know, about you know carers. You know, social services do not provide the shall we say service that they used to. 
years ago. I think there was a minimum criteria under high criteria and so on. And I think there's more and more onus actually on people living independently now compared to you know a few years ago. Um, my concern is really with regards to people, you know, declining carers assessments. Our carers, um, there's a lot more pressure on carers, shall we say, than there was years ago and so on. Um, is that pressure, is the decline in carers assessment because the pressure of people are actually under, because they're actually finding that they perhaps can't get the support or um, can't get the assistance that they require and they're actually saying, well, I'm not going to bother anymore, I'll do this myself. Have we looked at that issue? Yeah, can I come on? But it's a really good question. Um, uh, I, we haven't asked. We haven't asked, so we don't know. We really have been being quite reactive this year rather than being proactive and sort of doing that level of consultation and engagement. But what we have got is some really um, active parent carers groups and um, carers groups as well at the moment that we're working with to co-produce um, some of our provision or, or as much provision as we can actually. And, and also doing work around consulting and engaging with carers to share their experiences and their views on our provision and also the provision that we commission. Um, we're trying to raise the profile of carers of all ages through a range of medium, uh, media and communications. And I think as well as the issue around um, when people come to us and we offer them a carer's assessment, it might be also the time that they're trying to get care and support for people who may be in crisis, you know, so they they don't want to accept the carer support at that time. You know, it's, it goes further down the list and it's about having the um, conversations at the right time with people as well. So it's that's something that the team are looking at. We're doing, um, we've got an action plan basically with about 30 things on it that we're going to be focusing on. So we're looking at carers awareness training, carers rights training. We've also got carers champions within our own teams. So it's a, it's a conversation and it's a consideration that team are having centrally. Um, and, and we're also going to be proactively identifying carers as well, because like I say, the it's very small numbers that when we offer the assessments say yes and then even when we try to arrange the assessments they end up not going ahead you know for whatever reason so I you know we understand there's pressures on people and but it's also to, so the carers see the benefits as well so that's why we know using um co-producing this with carers and you know they should tell us how we can do it better so can I just go on and so really the lacks are going to play a very important part in this so are they forming part a part of this process to actually identify people and do you know it's a whole service so approach it's a whole service so yeah definitely local area coordinators um i know um later on um in the um policy commitment report we've got an update on local area coordinators and we've obviously got more now than we've ever had and and it's um but it's the whole team it's the service so our um day support officers you know if they're coming across individuals if common access points someone could, it really is a whole service responsibility with carers Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Tony Bedjews. Thank you, Chair. I've got a couple of questions, Amy, if I'm able to stop me if I'm asking too many and you want to uh, get uh, get an answer in, in between. Um, it, it, first of all, in terms of the uh, the increased complexity that uh, that was mentioned, um, what data does the common access point routinely try and capture about things like, for example, their current housing arrangements. I mean, are they living in sheltered housing or in private accommodation with families and so on and so forth? Are they in receipt of attendance allowance? Uh, those sorts of questions um, in order to build up a picture. And with regard to the, the local authorities' housing stock, especially sheltered housing stock, my understanding was that the sheltered housing end already produced care plans or care support plans, I think they call them, um, for every resident who wants them. Do we happen to know the numbers of those plans that are already there as a, a sort of starting point in terms of, of uh, assessing um, needs? Um, the, um, the other question is to do with the uh, integrated care fund and the uncertainty about the funding that was signalled in the report. I mean, do we know what factors will influence the decision on that and when? And is it likely to run on until after the, uh, the election in, in, on May the 6th? And then the final thing is in terms of um, the withdrawal of local health authority staff from managing um, learning disabilities. How was this justified? How was it managed? And which which officers in the health board took the decision? Thank you, Chair. 
OK, um, ooh, I didn't make a note of that last one, but I do know it because it comes <laughs> up a lot. Um, so um, the um, uh, the increased complexity and particularly the questions that the common access point um, asked, we um, uh, just very quickly, anecdotally, the, some information that we had um, an update. We have full staff briefings um, every few weeks on a Friday. Um, Clive, Dave, myself and um, Helen do them with our full team and we have an open question and answer sort of sessions as well. And the Common Access Point did an update this week and they were saying it was it was I wish you could have all heard it actually, because I think if you hear the work the team does, um, they they give people as much time as they need and as much time as is needed to get the information required. And it was you got a real sense there that they were asking, you know, so they cover the housing, the um, attendance allowance, etc. You know, everything that that involves um, people's lives. Um, but there is another option as well. If it doesn't get captured at the common access point, if it is referred through to the initial assessment team, that's when they're doing more of a drill down and more of a sort of work with individuals, getting to know their circumstances. In terms of what the specifics are that each team member asks, I don't know the detail, I'm afraid, but I do know that when I heard the team talk on Friday, last Friday, about the, um, you know, they were saying that they... Um, their work requires all senses and all um, all aspects of, um, I don't know if I'm misquoting this, Dave and uh, Councillor Lloyd can tell me, but you know, I felt I got the sense that the team were um, uh, being incredibly thorough with that approach. Um, but we can certainly look into it a bit more um, to, to give you a fuller answer if that's okay, Tony. In terms of the um, sheltered housing, um, I don't know. I don't know about the care plans. I don't have that detail and it's not in on these forms, so I can certainly look into that. That can that can be something we can follow up after the meeting if that's okay. On that aspect of it. Okay. And just with the ICF and so, in fact, I'll come back to that because I think that's something that Dave could respond to hopefully, um, uh, or I can give it a go if he's fallen off the call again. Um, with the learning disabilities, um, uh, caseloads is quite interesting actually. I, I um, this gets brought up um, reasonably frequently, but it, it has been um, 2016 was when the um, situation did change. It was it was to do with change of personnel and change of focus, um, and it is something that we're we're looking at again now just to make sure in terms of um obviously that's five years ago but you know just looking at in terms of the the case loads and where they're most appropriate to sit so at the moment as it says in the report of our 950 individual people who are supported by learning disability services um 900 of them are care managed by our teams and 50 are by health so it's it's an ongoing piece of work that we're doing with health colleagues at the moment mm. and dave i don't know if you want to come in on the icf uh, yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know absolutely, um, Tony, the answer to it. I definitely think it will be post elections. Yes. Um, I suppose our push in our region and across all regions will be well, we want an understanding of um, what new scheme or what new arrangements might be put in place to support. Um, uh, regional working and regional innovation as uh, you know as early this year as possible to obviously plan our ongoing programs for next year so we don't want anything you know going up to end of financial year this year with you know risk of um, all of the transformational work that we've been doing and all of the um, success really in extremely difficult times this year to be undermined through um, uncertainty of, um, you know, what the schemes and the infrastructure and the governance might be going forward. I think Welsh Government have a good understanding, at least now, that it can't be a, a kind of assumption that somehow um, all of the work that we've been doing that has been reliant on, um, you know, this different funding stream can somehow be absorbed within you know core funding of either local authorities or health boards frankly that you know that just that that would just be um you know nonsense the the you know, i think if if there was a kind of my view that perhaps you know perhaps this work could just be uh, become you know self sustaining um uh, I, I, I think that's that's been burst now. There is there is an acceptance that the improvement work that's been um, undertaken 
has helped in terms of financial sustainability and has certainly helped in terms of shifting um, you know, service models to be more fit for purpose for people and people's expectations going forward. It's not a straightforward, you know, you can just replace cash that's already in the system, you know, with, you know, somehow with this this funding that we've become um, reliant on to do all this good work um, going forward. So, so I'm expecting a different scheme, something to replace it. Um, uh, we will be pushing for that to be uh, you know, to have an understanding of that as early as possible um, this financial year. It will be after the election, um, but I, I can't be any clearer than that, Tony. OK, thank you. Paxton Hood Williams, you had your hand up and now you haven't, have you? Well, I was going to talk about assessments again, but we moved on from there, so we'll, we'll come back to that again at another, at another meeting, I'm sure, soon. Okie dokie. Are you all happy with the, the we've all answered you asked your questions? Can I oh Tony, you wanted to say something? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to come back on on the, the point that was made about the, the learning disabilities stuff. Um and there was one further question that I deliberately omitted because I thought I'd already asked enough. Um I mean, do I take it that in terms of the changes and that um uh, the local authority, the, the health authority have, have made and the, the balance of responsibility for the caring needs of the, 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 the people with um, uh, um, uh, learning disabilities and so on, that the local authority is broadly happy with the division of work, as it were. I mean, that's the impression I got. I mean, I don't know whether that, that, that that's false. Um, uh, the 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 other the other question is is a slightly different one. It's, it's purely out of, of interest. In the report on um, residential uh, reablement, there's a reference to difficulties with the in-house medication process and its complications. And I was intrigued to wonder what that was referring to because I hadn't come across that particular conundrum before. I mean, if it's simple, uh, a quick rundown of what it is and what we do to put it right would be helpful. But if it's complicated, we'll leave it to another day. All right, Amy or Dave, do you want to answer that? Uh, yeah, I'll start. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, to do with the Learning Disabilities Care Managing and are we broadly happy? That's quite... A <laughs> Broadly, yes. No, I, I think truly is something that we've got to um, work with health board colleagues on now, particularly, you know, there's different teams, different people involved. And I think it's it's time to just look at it and just ensure that the most um, appropriate care manager is is working with individuals. I think that's what we've got, we, what we've got to look at. So I think it's um, particularly people who've got um, continuing health care needs. You know, we do think exactly. they should be with health colleagues. You know, and if there are any that are with us, there are a number of individuals who are still working through whether um, we, you know, we think they should be continuing health and our colleagues in health, you know, we've got to go through that decision process. And because of the COVID year, there are a larger number of um, individuals on that list than we would like to have, you know, with this sort of almost in this undecided position or pending position. So I think that's, so are we happy? Not 100% because we'd like to work through that. So that's that aspect of it. Um, and I can't find the reference, sorry, review of medication process. Um, is it on page um, nine and ten? You're talking about nine overlapping to ten. Um, I'm just trying to find my own notes. Uh, okay. uh, it, it was in um, paragraph seven, I think. That's what what my number is showing, and the performance report. Um, uh, it's on the residential reablement, um, and it says there's an issue about in-house medication process and its complexities. Um, and there's a suggestion it should be revised, and I was just interested in what was going to be revised. Okay. Um, sorry, I can't quite see. Yeah, the review of medical medication process with staff, team training, review of yeah. service specific guidance. Yeah. I think it's just a, yeah. So, um, sorry, what we're worried about is the in house medication process. Sorry, yeah. Oh, um, again, this is. I'm going to make an educated guess on this, I'm afraid, without knowing the absolute specifics, if that's OK. But I think this will be linked to the complexity um, 
that we are now seeing or, or some um, increased levels of um, re individual requirements in terms of our reablement beds. And so there, there is um, just ensuring that we've got the right process and procedures in place. We've also got a reasonably new team in Bonamine as well. So I think it's linked around that support as well, just to make sure absolutely everything is um, uh, linked to that sort of hospital to home process and ensuring that people have the, the appropriate support. We work very closely with our colleagues in health on this. You know, this is a, a, um, a both team support individuals, you know, so whether it needs to be the district nurse team or our care staff. So it's about um, uh, ensuring those processes are most appropriate, whether that's the district nurses or, like I say, our team that deliver that support. So that I'm sure will be linked to the um, acuity, I suppose, we're seeing and in terms of um, the, all the other the health requirements of individuals in our reablement sites. Would that be fair, Dave? I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, as well. no, absolutely. I, um, it, it will undoubtedly be linked to that. We know that um, we know for all the reasons that you've already described that um, individuals are pre presented with more complex needs. We also know that we've tried to with Bonamine House in response to COVID, but I suspect a development that we'd pushed anyway um, to, to try and increase the um, extent to which we are resourced and capable to support people with more complex health needs, which means they can, you know, we can support discharge from hospital quicker, which, um, uh, and it will be a double checking of, uh, well, hang on a minute, our, our, our historic processes that we relied upon wouldn't necessarily be fit for purpose for dealing with um, individuals with those health needs and that that could go as far at some stage to saying do we need to revisit the skill mix do we need more health staff um, involved in um, that model I know the health board are up for that but it's still a work in progress so it'll be a, 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 re a reassurance quality assurance um, and reassurance of let's just make sure we've got everything in place to support that even if in the meantime, as Amy's described, um, you know, we're having to pull staff in from the community, community health staff, um, to support some of that work whilst um, whilst we just get some um, uh, processes as fit for purpose as possible. It, it shouldn't um, lead us to infer, you know, there's risk associated with that. This is more about, now hang on a minute, you know, make make sure there aren't risks associated with that. It's, um, uh, it, as I said, it's quality assurance. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Amy, for being so concise and, and thank you very much. Uh, you're all happy with the questions now? I can go on to item number seven, which is adult services policy commitments. I don't know if it's Dave or Clive wanted to lead on this. Do we, should I kick off, Dave, and uh, uh, and you can come in? Yeah, so thanks. Thanks, uh, everyone. Just uh, coming back on some of the points that Amy touched on on the previous report. I think in, in terms of carers, I think it is something that uh, you know would be really useful to come back to. And I know Amy has outlined um, uh, the action plan that we have in place, but we discuss it regularly uh, in terms of, of creating that support environment. You know, for me, it's about uh, you know engendering a culture where support of carers and getting uh, the right carer assessment in place that actually uh, people feel um, willing that to uh, engage in and they're going to get an outcome out of it is really important but it has to be everyone's business I don't think it's something that uh, particularly sits or should sit with one team although they might lead on it but it has as Amy has highlighted it has to be everyone's business that we um, we are aware of carers of their responsibilities and and take the opportunity to offer support at every every opportunity so you know that's that's a sort of medium longer term culture uh, that we need to engender similar to the sorts of things that we do around safeguarding it's everyone's business isn't it and it should be all our businesses as well in terms of supporting carers I think um so in terms com just coming back to the policy commitments report then so um yeah I mean the, the, the thing that, that I, I just want to open up with really was is is about the report and and how it's acted for me anyway as uh, uh, as a as a as a reminder of how uh, our policy commitments have become embedded into everything we do um and if you read through the report there's some real um some real uh, in, you know really good outcomes that we've we're reporting on 
which have taken place through the most difficult of circumstances. And I think that that really reflects what I've just said about the underpinning of the policy commitments, not as something that we look at on a monthly basis or a six monthly basis and report back to anyone, but as something now that uh, culturally that we do as business as usual. And I think, you know, that's reflected in, in some of the things that are underpinned around our regional approach, which is, I think has, has got stronger and certainly got a lot stronger during COVID and, and has, has stood us in good stead. Our partnership working, our integrated uh, roles with, with, with health and, you know, ably led by, uh, by Amy and, and that, that role that, that's been created. But some of the really positive stuff that we've continued to do, uh, Amy talked about broker uh, brokerage levels. Uh, and again, you know, I, I know personally that uh, when I was involved in brokerage a couple of years ago, they, there was the waiting list, as, as, as Amy has highlighted, was, was you know, quite enormous. It took weeks to get a, a care package in place, but uh, that is at, at, at really good levels now and sustainable le levels. And the reablement aspect of, of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and through COVID, I think has 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 been has been really exemplary, uh, and the work that's taken place around some of our um, hospital to home initiatives and, and keeping people in home, independent living, reablement, and keeping people in in their homes for as long as possible. As uh, again, as I say, is business as usual, and it's it's at the heart of everything we do. Um, so it's just looking through the reports. Uh, uh, and some of the the, 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 the main aspects of, of the commitments, you know, again, a really great achievement in terms of our local area coordinators. We've always already touched on how important they've been prior to COVID, how really, really important they've come into their own during COVID and how we've managed to expand those uh, as we've come up uh, of COVID through support with our partners and and through uh, our commitment as, as, a, as, a, as an authority. Independent living, as I say, is, is at the heart of everything we do, keeping people at home, um, you know, and we're seeing, uh, you know, that really uh, come into its own um, with, as, it, as the report says, an increased number of clients passing through the reablement pathway. Uh, and having that reablement support uh, has been a real success. And, you know, the book that's been taking place in Bonamine House has, uh, has been really, really excellent. Um, you know, we're looking to invest, to continue to invest in our social service provision and, um, and and always looking at redesigning services. And again, a great example of that, you know, I suppose is the reaction to COVID where, you know, we talked about the front end uh, hub model and restructuring that, uh, you know, in a pretty efficient and effective way quite quickly to uh, to the to the sort of uh, model that we and restructure that we have now, which is uh, it, again something that we're ongoing and review. So another really good example of 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 a service being able to um, you know being flexible and being able to move quite quickly to meet demands. Um, Dave uh, and I think Amy has touched on WCCIS CCIS. So with all this going on and all the challenges that we've had, what do we decide to do? We thought, oh, we'll go live with a, a blinking huge mainframe computer system just to uh, just to add to everyone's woes. But, you know, again, through the planning that's taken place on, on that, I think, uh, you know, we're able to report the feedback that we had last Friday, certainly from teams, was that, you know, the uh, that had gone as well as could be expected. Uh, and uh, that was ensured through support that we put in place to help people. Uh, undoubtedly, there will be continue to be teething problems with a system of that size. But, you know, uh, I think it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's been a, has gone as well as could be expected and it hasn't caused us any any huge, huge issues. You know, where we go forward, you know, we, we did a commissioning review uh, uh, in terms of our focus on complex care. And and some of that may have been delayed through through COVID. But as we move forward, you know, in, our discuss in my discussions with Dave and Amy, we're really going to focus now on on ensuring that uh, you know we get that um, uh, ability to offer complex care uh, residential support in place and follow up on on the commitments that we made through the um, uh, 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 the commissioning review. And finally, absolutely critical is the well-being of our of our our workforce, particularly as we come out of COVID. As I said on Friday, they, they, this needs to be at the heart and centre of everything we do. And, uh, you know, we can talk about, the, uh, maybe not today, but it's certainly a future meetings. We can bring back 
um, you know, the, the, the work that we're doing in terms of well-being. I know Deb Reed and her team have been working to put things in place to, to make sure that we get that support structure in place. Uh, uh, and as Dave said, you know, there's going to be time now where we need to encourage people to, to recharge their batteries uh, after the difficulties of the last year in COVID, but a lot of people didn't take time off. Uh, you know, we really pushed them and uh, uh, and asked them to deliver, uh, deliver and deliver again over the last year. So, you know, all that planning that needs to take place in terms of making sure that we have a workforce that's sustainable going into the next few months and uh, and beyond. So, like I said, I think there's some really good examples, some really good outcomes that we can point to. Uh, through a really difficult time, uh, and uh, but I, I think you know the fact that uh, I say lots of these, uh, lots of the commitments are now embedded. Uh, the reports, that's the really pleasing thing for me is that it it, it reflects that embedment. And uh, as I said at the beginning, it's uh, very much business as usual in our in our thinking and our uh, actions that we put put in together. Thank you, Clive. Do you want to add anything, Dave, before we take for questions? I think, I think it's a great summary from the uh, Cabinet member. I, I think my reflections, I was reading the um, report um, you know, prior to um, the session now, was uh, what remarkably good fit there is. You know, those commitments that uh, were made, you know, a few years ago that helped us stand in, you know, as good a stead as we could during this most difficult period, and they continue to inform uh, and will continue to inform our adaptation and recovery, um, you know, post-COVID. And I think Clive described it well when he said, look, it's, it's, it's embedded now in our transformation plans, in our service plans, in the um, focus that we have. There'll always be more to do. You not get to a point where you say, well, there's not more opportunity to improve, but those those broad headings which set out the things that we should um, focus on, um, you know, remain absolutely um, absolutely bang on as far as I'm, I'm concerned. So, you know, likewise, um, you know, as, as uh, Clive has said, re really pleased with the um, progress that we can have um, evidence and that. You know that's down to the leadership of the you know, likes of Amy and Helen, their senior management teams, you know partners across the region, but most importantly, uh, our fantastic workforce. So, um, you know, good good stuff as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Dave. Paxton, you want to uh, lift your hand up? Uh, thank you, Chairman. And just to come back on a couple of things, really. Obviously, you've got a new policy going in place here. Nobody's going to argue about that, but you've got to. Sorry, how does this tie in with the commissioning review that you did a couple of years ago and where we are with that? And obviously also with the procurement exercise that we also went through fairly recently in terms of how we bring this all together in terms of the new policy. Are you happy that you uh, have those the right things in place, particularly in terms of procurement, to ensure that you can put this policy in place as you want to? Do you want to respond to that, Amy, or do you want me to? Yeah, yeah go on then. <laughs> yeah, um, I think. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I mean, in terms of it, none of it's inconsistent, Paxton. I think the you know these sets out that these set out the um, headings. The um, you know you you know that we signed off as a council uh, uh, an optimum model for adult services, which is entirely consistent with uh, uh, policy commitments that. Um, uh, you know, have been made for us as, um, as uh, uh, council. I, I suppose I put it under the heading of there's always more work to do, though. There's always more work that we'll be able to do under these broad headings. But nothing, we're not signalling, um, I suppose from my um, perspective, a change of direction. Um, so I'm happy, yes, Paxton, that um, all that we have done, all that, you know, continues to inform our planning, our thinking going forward, it all still fits under, um, um, uh, you know, under those the broad commitments that we've made as um, as a council. And I spoke that that observation I made about it helped us stand, you know, us, us, um, you know, being as good a position as we could be during these most difficult of times, where we, um, you know, where we 
had to respond to add resilience or to amend things to be, um, uh, you know, more able to to cope as best we could with the challenges that COVID threw at us. It still fitted. We didn't deviate from, um, uh, I suppose, our over approach, Count, uh, our first approach, for example. Do we concentrate more on uh, making sure our services support those people with the most complex needs? Do we make sure they're flexible enough to respond to whatever changing circumstances we're facing? We had, we had lots of examples of using our in-house provision for those very, you know, very purpose. And, uh, you know, during, you know, the period of COVID, you know, sometimes saying, well, actually, the world looks completely different at the moment. So our services are going to have to respond completely differently at the moment, whereas what we looked for from um, predominantly from, um, uh, you know, the commissioned market was, yeah, but, you know, we'll, we'll support you to carry on, um, you know, dealing with um, uh, you know, business in the way that you always had, or obviously it did mean changes for them as well. But the heavy lifting around dramatic changes to provision, we were able to deliver in-house. And it forced, I think, for me, that decision um, council took to continue investing in having, you know, a significant proportion of um, service capacity in-house, not to move to a model where um, everything was externally commissioned, which we know that some authorities have. I think we were in, you know, we we we, we were in a position to best support our communities by having maintained the the balanced approach that we did in the past. In class, Paxton, but you have to challenge me if I didn't. Oh, that's fine. Thank you, Chris. You've got a question. Right, thank, thank you very much for the report, Clive. There are a couple of issues on the commissioning review. <clears throat> I, can, I seem to remember, I know it was a long time ago now, well, there were issues surrounding domiciliary care and day services and the level of, you know, where we would uh, put those services and how much the day services we would carry on doing. So I think the commissioning review was quite uh, open about that and and we were, we were expecting feedback on on that, on, on the actual level of care and what the intervention uh, rates would be, especially on day services. The the only other thing I would ask, and I have to say the local area coordinators did change their job profile substantially during the initial lockdown of COVID, and they actually did something which was quite, quite excellent in all honesty, and I think we should acknowledge that fact um, at some stage in the future because of the way in which everyone and even the people that stepped into you know that came from library services or came from other services that helped out they did a really really good job and i and i think we should celebrate that the one thing i would would like to ask is um about the funding for lacs now in the report um believe it or not i can't find it uh, in the report it says it says about funding from um various uh like housing associations etc 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 uh, uh, uh how secure are we i know we had it for a couple of years um how secure are we about that funding and uh, because it is you know given that housing associations seem to be able to get money from everywhere and do anything they like um is there any way in which we can tie them for any longer uh and if so uh, can we? And the other thing is then, um, is there any other external funding that we could hopefully get um, to to supplement what we require to, to fund the early, uh, the local area coordinators? Thank you. Yeah. Especially when the fire service did originally fund and that was withdrawn quite drastically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll come in on this one. Shall I? I'll, I'll, I'll just That's give good. both points. Um, so the day services, I think um, the point around the commissioning reviews is that the work both with residential and, and the work that started on day services, which I think at the time was called the fourth commissioning review, wasn't it? Because it was looking at all other aspects of our service, um, is being picked up and carried on um, as a review 
but sorry, as a review, but in light of what we've learned from the last year, I think that's really key. You know, we can't we can't um, look at it in, with any other lens now. You know, we know what we've seen, we know how the provision, and we know what people are wanting that's different, and and we'll very much co-produce it with our service users as well to see what works for them. So, it um, the level of care and the intervention will be looked at. You know that that's the work that's happening in the next 12 months so it's in our service plans it's in our improvement plans and it's a real focus of the team um with like i say the co-production at the center of it so ensuring it we're we're making the services responsive to people um local area coordination um uh, yeah i mean the funding is not straightforward um it's from a, a numerous sources this year we've um really benefited from the fact that the housing support grant has so dramatically increased and the fact that we see the direct link between um, the support of the local area coordinators and, and the impact they have um, on all aspects of people's lives, but, but in terms of the sort of preventing homelessness agenda alongside um, the social services and sort of well-being aspects as well. Um, we've got funding from the RSLs, the um, uh, housing uh, providers. We've had some funding from the university as well. We've had funding from health as well. So what we're looking at in the next 12 months or within the 12 months sorry is um how we really diversify these funding streams because whilst we've had the additional housing support grant this year you know we hope that continues we've had um uh, funding from the regional partnership pots of money as well through through health um or, or through the regional partnership sorry so it's all of our money isn't it um the work we're doing with Swansea University, which we have um, included in the report around evaluating, so it's a bit of a longitudinal study from for local area coordination from the initial study they did in 2016 to really show the um, social and financial impact. Hopefully it's quite bold. We've given them a very sort of um, clear brief in terms of what we want to look at, but we want to see how um, that return on investment that local area coordination provides. And hopefully then that will give us the really sound financial model to, to take it forward on a more sustainable footing. Can I come back on that? Um, on on the, the day services, when if it would be nice if, well, I know that um, my own scrutiny board is looking again at uh, the commissioning reviews because we were going to review their impact on different services uh, and it would be interesting to see at some stage in the future i don't think currently is the right the right time to do anything like that but i think at some stage in the future would be worth uh, a while exercise to see how that commission and review has worked out and and what the role of it has been and if you could keep us updated on the funding for the um, local area coordinators because i think you know, considering what they have been through and what they've done, I think we should support them. And if we can get money from elsewhere, great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Tony, you've got a question. Yes, thank you, Chair. It's um, the bottom of page two and over the top on page three to do with promoting independent living. And I mean, I fully support the, the intention, but I've got three sort of follow up questions, as it were. Uh, and I think best described uh, directed to to Clive if he's content. The first is, is the housing service in the local authority as committed to this programme as is social services? Is it a jointly owned cross council policy commitment? Um, the second thing, and this is an even naughtier question, is would the extent of the additional independent living that you've been able to achieve, both in terms of longevity and quality, would that be something that you would link to outcomes in terms of outcome budgeting? Would it have the the range of service of, of, uh, of services and an indicator of uh, the kind of outcomes you wanted, um, given the numbers of people likely to be involved? Because uh, that would that would be very interesting. Um, and the third one, it picks up what what Amy was alluding to a few minutes ago. Has has this aspect been included in the university's assessment of the impact of local area coordination and the wider policy direction of the council? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, in terms of the, the housing uh, commitment, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I would expect, uh, you know, this is a, a council wide uh, policy commitment. I would absolutely expect that the houses, housing services uh, uh, play their part in, the, in this. And I know that there's, um, there's regular interaction between uh, between social services and our housing colleagues around some of this, uh, some of the independent living 
uh, Tony. So, yeah, absolutely. I would fully expect that, that to be committed. Um, in, in terms of the point two about the the outcomes and budget, and I think I told I meant I spoke about this last time, didn't I? And I uh, mentioned about um, you know what what good outcomes looks like in terms of uh, us keeping people, you know, managing the numbers or monitoring the numbers, measuring the numbers then of people that uh, remain independent living at home as opposed to um, to being uh, in within the care home residential care home environment. That's not only about in deep keeping people at home. This is about measuring the support and and through reablement, in, you know, uh, helping managing to reduce the the, uh, the support potentially that that they receive. So all that is is part of our our, uh, our initial sort of outcome strategy uh, when we set the budget. You know, we, we haven't got, you know, if we're looking for a, a specific, um, uh, you know, methodology of budgeting that has changed from what we've traditionally done in, in terms of budgeting, then then that doesn't exist. You know, there's no change in the formula uh, as provided by our finance colleagues in terms of the structure of the funding related directly to to the, the outcome measures um, in a way that may exist in some other organisation. So, you know, we're totally focused in inverted commas on an outcomes based budgeting uh, uh, methodology because we want to see the good outcomes and we absolutely um, you know will if if the, I suppose what we would look at it in, a, in another way as well is that if the outcomes weren't being achieved by the, the, our decisions at the beginning of the financial year then we would look at uh, uh, allocating those budgets in, in possibly into a different different way in, in, in to different actions to achieve those outcomes. But if, is there a methodology from finance that uh, uh, that our budget is built on 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 specifics? Then then you know it it it, it isn't uh, uh, as far as I'm aware. You know we we had our budget allocation and we allocate it uh, uh, to the priorities and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Uh, what was the last one? Um, it was about the lack of valuation, wasn't it? Yeah. Shall I come in on that, Clive? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the um, I just had to, gave me time to find the specification and remind myself um, that we um, uh, that we've we've still got a bit of work to do in terms of fine tuning some of it. So there is an opportunity to highlight it, but but we have uh, as one of the um, objectives, we are looking at the specific challenges of um, uh, that have faced individuals and the area coordinators are focusing on. Um, we've looked at we're looking at food, poverty, housing, um, social isolation, and mental health. Um, so certainly housing has been highlighted there, but also looking to assess the impact of um, how the local authority and local area coordination has responded to that. So it's it's something certainly whilst being named in terms of the challenges, um, certainly the links in, with housing we can uh, pick up and I can highlight that to the evaluators when we have uh, our next meeting. Thank you. Tony, do you want to come back at all? Well, just briefly on the on the notion of outcomes and, and budgets and things. Um, I mean, I, I'm fully with the local authority in wanting to be innovative and pioneering in terms of going down this road. Um, but I mean, at some point, I think we're going to have to come to at least a draft list of the different kinds of outcomes that we might be wanting to achieve, whether it's by service area, you know, learning disabilities, care of the elderly, um, the, the links with younger people and so on and so forth, um, whether it's outcomes in terms of well-being measures um, or life satisfaction or whatever. Um, added life, whether it's an outcome in organisational terms, in terms of the, the limited number of rows we've had with the health authority, um, uh, and for that matter with any other authority. Um, it might be the extent to which we're content with whatever government's in, uh, in the Senate. All, all, I'm, all I'm suggesting is that I think sooner rather than later, we ought to be bold enough to at least produce a, a provisional list of different kinds of outcomes to which resources, both money and human and others, can be attached and refine it through use. And I don't sense that we're quite there yet across the piece, not just in adult social services. Um, it would be great to be able to be there. And I mean, some time ago, I, some colleagues might remember, I, I, I brought a paper that, that gave, I, I forget how many product lines, as it were, if you want to call them that, that operate across social services. And I'm not suggesting that you would need outcomes for every single product line in terms of where people were living, what their conditions were, what their backgrounds were and so on and so forth. Um, but I think we ought to have a, a, a shot between us at uh, producing a prototype. If we only test it 
um, not for real, but if we only test it in the first year in, in, in a modelling sense to see what it would look like if we had been using it. Um, I'm just trying to encourage people to be bold because I think this local authority, and maybe in the old days, the old health authority, but maybe it still applies now, would be wanting to be bold with you. Jockey. Chris, do you want to say something? You've got your hand up. Yeah, on, on, on outcome based. Uh, budget in which Tony's commenting on the, the the problem with human human beings is that the outcome can be great one day, the following day the outcome has just shot away. It's and it, it it's a collective outcome. I think Tony's on about, and I think it's a collective matrix of outcomes. So if the, if the idea is that we our outcome is to have everybody off the streets and have no uh, no um, rough sleepers, then that's one outcome. I can understand that outcome, but I think some of the other outcomes that taken is, is, is an example of product line and then using the product to, to give you an outlet, to give you a outcome, um, but then say what that outcome should be. I think that that actually takes a great deal of effort and do we get what you want at the end of it with that sort of system or is that what performance monitoring should be about so i think there's a discussion to be had about performance monitoring and or outcome monitoring because i think there are two separate issues and I think those are the issues that would need to be talked about that sometime in the future if you want to do that. OK, no other questions for Amy, Dave and Clive? Oh, Jeff, you've got your hands yes. up. Yes, sorry. sorry, you know, completely different from budgets, although it's probably linked. I can actually, it's something that we haven't spoken about for quite some time as part of the report. And you can actually say, see that you're actually carrying out a commissioning review. It's the uh, assistive technology strategy. Um, where are we here? You know, are we where we were two or three years ago? Or, you know, how, how well developed is that at the present time? Who wants to take that one up? Shall I come in on this one just very briefly? Because I would say, um, and uh, and I haven't done it yet, but this does sit with my colleague Helen. <laughs> I mean, I haven't I'm not not using that as an opportunity, but it really does. But um, I do know it's on a, a future agenda, isn't it? In terms of scrutiny, we have moved it because uh, it's it has been delayed by the year we've had. It, it's definitely been delayed, but it's not off the agenda. Right? I know certainly it's in our improvement plan as a service uh, for the coming year, and it's it's been um it's it's aligned to one of the principal officers. They know who's leading on it, so it's. It's a piece of work we will be bringing forward to you. Thank you, Amy. OK, Jeff. Yeah. OK, then I will go on to item number eight, which is um, looking at the work programme. And I hope you all realise that the next meeting is in the new financial year. And so because we've had uh, three meetings that have joined with children's services, we've pushed the next meeting and we have uh, that on the agenda. All right, so are you all happy with that? Well, Jeff, you've got your hand up. Or is that a... I assume that she's done. So great, thank you all for a really informative meeting. Thank you, Amy, for all your help during this. And although Helen wasn't here, you did really well. So thank you all. And I'd like to close the meeting now and look forward to seeing you all in June, on June the 2nd. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks you. Well done. Thanks, you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.